You're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, episode 114. I can't seem to create products without putting a storyline with them. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped. And now it's time to light it up. Welcome to Gift Biz Unwrapped, your source for industry-specific insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And now, here's your host, Sue Monheit. Hi there, it's Sue, and welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick-and-mortar shop, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. And today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Carmi Hwaut. Carmi has years of experience designing gift and home decor for retailer, big box, and global distributors worldwide. He is the co-founder and creative director of Smash Up Studio, a cutting-edge design studio. They specialize in marketing original, repurposed gift and home accessories and are involved in all aspects of design, startup, manufacturing, and marketing. Carmi's newest venture is taking recycled motherboards and turning them into home decor and art sculptures. He calls them computer bugs to love. Welcome to the show, Carmi. Thanks, Sue. Glad to be here. I'd like to start off, as you already know, by having you describe a motivational candle because we're all creatives here. It gives us a little bit of a different insight into what you're all about. So if you were to tell us about your candle, what color would it be and what would be the quote? I would say that my candle is definitely not your usual shape, which is a reflection of you know where I've been in my career as far as design. But I would say it's a sculptural shape much like a human figure. And also the colors would probably be heading towards the very bright colors, multiple colors, not rainbow necessarily, but certainly eye-catching colors that are very contemporary. But most important, I would say that the light that shines from the candle would be extremely bright. It's not a reflection of who I am, but I would say that the brightness is really a reflection of kind of creating a uh, sense of happiness when you look upon the light so that it's really a feeling of warmth and inspiration. As far as a quote that would go with it, one of my favorite quotes because I started my uh, educational career in college and studying English and literature, I was a big fan of Shakespeare. I always love the quote, we are such stuff as dreams are made of or made on, which really talks about being a dreamer and a creator and aspiring to not just dream, but to take your dreams and turn them into something really wonderful. Beautiful. And I think as creators, we have no choice but to be somewhat of dreamers or else how are we going to create things that are different and unique and totally ours? We have to envision it all first you know, in some type of a dream state, and then we bring it back to reality. Right. And sometimes the dream state is not a dream state, but it's really a conversation and a pen and a napkin. Oh, good point. Yep. I totally (laughs) agree with you there. (laughs) Well, and I have to say, Carmi, no surprise that your candle has all these elements, you know, like human and it shines and it's multiple colors because you're a creative director after all. I should have expected that, right? (laughs) Yep. I really want to talk a lot about your new project and the new product because I think that our listeners will find a lot of value with that. But you have such a big backstory. Will you go through and tell us a little bit about your history, your involvement in the gifting industry overall, and then we'll dive into your current product after that. Super. Okay, so my career is long and very deep, but you know, really twists and turns, but really an amazing adventure for me. I started in the mid 80s and I was uh, actually signed on to get into sales management in the hotel industry and worked for IT&T and I had a six month break and before I started my training after having been a little bit in the corporate world and I took my backpack and went overseas and uh, Asia travel was just beginning back then and uh, for backpackers and after a month through Thailand and roaming around I actually met some Filipinos who became very very close with and travel with them and uh, Anyway, fast forward, I ended up in the Philippines six months later and was introduced to my good friend's sister-in-law, who was a silversmith, and that was my first factory. In that town, I found a little tree of bells for sale at the market, and my friends who I'd met 
in Thailand and traveled with through Nepal, it taught me the art of buying and selling. And we bought a, together a lot of different things from jewelry to rugs to sculptures. And they brought them back to the Philippines. I brought them back to actually Chicago, where I live now, and sold a bunch of my wares to the Field Museum, which was really my first sale. And anyway, one of the things that I bought was a little tree of bells. I bought about 50 of these things. I was really buying and selling just to pay for my trip back then. And once I started my big corporate job, I kind of put all this in the background, but all of a sudden I was getting reorders and I was in this big corporate job and nine to five and working weekends uh, for no money and uh, decided that this really wasn't who I was. So I borrowed $10,000 from my mom and invested in a design of my own making, which was a little tree of bells with silk flowers and jade on it. And I created this crazy story that said, if you ring the bells of the tree, what I call the prosperity tree, you will receive good fortune and health and happiness. Well, I borrowed this $10,000 from my mom, import it about 5,000 of these little trees, which we couldn't get into the door of my apartment. I lived in Los Angeles back then, and they sat out in the garage for a couple of days. And I quit my corporate job and started selling it to the hotel gift stores, the people, some of the people I knew throughout Los Angeles. And next thing I knew, I was on the street selling these things. And all of a sudden, boom, something clicked. And I was in hotel gift stores and hospitals and really selling the product all over the place. But it was a struggle. I was still having to work the street fairs and I went to my first Atlanta gift show before they built these new glorious buildings that they have there and was stuck up in some showroom with a few other exhibitors. And uh, my first show really wasn't much going on. And I see this buyer come walking down the aisle who had just, I thought, gone bankrupt and had owed me a couple thousand dollars, which is a lot then, uh, a lot now. And I confronted him and said, hey, you went bankrupt. You ordered from me. You didn't pay for me, et cetera, et cetera. He said he'd make it up to me. And I looked down at his badge and it said Home Shopping Network. Oh, no. <laughs> Home Shopping Network was only about a year old at that point. And I went to Clearwater sat down with him and we did variations of my existing product. The next thing I know, he gave me a PO for five containers and we were on Home Shopping Network. But the best thing he did was introduce me to the jewelry buyer. In those days, there was only a couple of them. And she sat me down and wrote me a quarter of a million dollar order for what was really one small box of silver jewelry. And the factory that was making my little decorative trees was actually a silversmith by trade. And that's really was my first launch into the industry. Uh, of course, Home Shopping Network tried to cancel the order three days before it was delivered. And I had to beg and plead and Eventually, I took it, but I took those funds and used that to invest in the infrastructure of my company, which went for 23 years. It was called Prosperity Tree International. And we had quite a long run. We were really a company that dealt mostly in gift items. And then about five or six years into our existence, we saw the writing on the wall. We really went into home decor and tableware in a big way. And luckily for us, the timing was perfect because China was relatively inexpensive back then. Packaging was a little bit of a challenge, but the thing that they were still able to do that they're really not able to do now is to offer good handcraft, in our case it was hand-painted ceramics, at a very, very affordable price and really high quality. And we hit a little niche that we really became a kind of a little cutting-edge company selling tableware and gift products, heavy focus on what we call functional art. That's kind of what Prosperity Tree was. You know, we were relatively a middle to small size company, pretty well known in the gift industry for many years. And I decided as the factories were having a harder, harder time of manufacturing what we were doing, I decided to make a shift in my own career and have a family and went into the design side of the industry instead. Okay, so I'm going to stop you here because I do have a couple of questions for you about what you've just talked about. Let's go back to the very first product, that prosperity tree that had the story connected to it. Did you find that that helped you sell the product? Now, I know you were in your startup mode, so, you know, you were getting sales on the streets or, you know, at the shows, wherever. But did you find or what's your comment on having, first of all, naming the product? Because prosperity tree is so opportunistic. I mean, it's a word that people want. I mean, people all want prosperity, right? But you had a story connected to your product. Did you find that that added value and helped you sell? 
Oh, 100%. My perspective on creating product in general is the storyline is such a crucial side of marketing. I think I've always been a storyteller. My uh, teenage daughter will attest to this, that I can't stop telling her stories to this day. I think it's a huge part of why people bought our products. It was a unique design. It was a unique concept. But I think we took that same concept of creating the legend or the story, and little tongue-in-cheek, but we called it a legend that was created in the Far East, which really wasn't. It was created in my head. (laughs) We took that concept. We really, we made it happen on a lot of different types of product. I'll give you another example. We worked with a project with Disney World many years ago, creating a product called Wish Upon a Star. And it was simply a gold star with a Swarovski crystal in the middle with a nice velvet pouch. And the idea is that you would take the star and you make a wish. But an interesting thing that we did with the product, not only did it fit into their theme nicely with Wish Upon a Star theme, we hooked up with uh, Make-A-Wish Foundation back then. And We gave a certain percentage of proceeds to make a wish. And it was a really nice give back type of situation. They appreciated, we appreciated, and it helped sell the product. Similar type of thing. We really love the golfing industry and gift products around the golfing industry. We took a real golf ball and we basically painted it gold or brass looking and we put a little hanger on it and we put a little hang tag that called it the good luck golf ball. If you get one, you'll never shoot over par again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we sold a, thousands and thousands of those. I'll give you one more example. We were really trying to do some interesting stuff back then. We were taking real pine cones and we were covering them with real silver, which was really a challenge because a pine cone, and again, we weren't picking them off the trees. They were falling. This was in the Philippines. And we spent almost a year trying to figure out how to put silver over a pine cone. Anyway, we turned it to a Christmas ornament and same idea, created a storyline about the silver pine. And it was a huge, huge success for us. Unfortunately, I was a purist back then and I refused to knock myself off. You know, in other words, make it out of resin. And I let some of the bigger companies like Department 56 and Kurt Adler do it for us instead. And we just kept going on with the uh, real pine cone version of it. Gift Biz listeners, I think this is a big, big topic and idea in terms of your product as well. And how you can separate yourself from other people who are making something similar to you is create a story. Carmi's talking about the fact that these stories didn't already exist. He had to create a story behind the product. But it's perfect because then it gives you, number one, something to talk about how your product is different and unique. Number two, great source for ad copy as you're talking and promoting online or wherever you are sharing the stories of your product and getting visibility on your product. So think about this. And Carmi just gave us a number of examples of what he's done. The other thing that Carmi's doing that I think is super important is if you go back to the beginning of his story, his journey took twists and turns because he met and was exposed and was out there and saw other people. And so by connecting with other people, the product took a little twist. And then doing something else, being at the Atlanta show, maybe it's not so bad that sometimes the people owe you money, Carmi, I'm not sure. (laughs) But, you know, just those little interactions, but you have to be face to face. So part of all of this is you have to get out in public and be face to face, whether it's shows or networking or meeting other people where you can collaborate, such as make a wish, that type of thing. I definitely uh, say that is a very valid point. Keep going, bouncing off of walls. I mean, a lot of things don't work. Well, tell us one that didn't. Give us a horror story here. So we know we're all the same, right? (laughs) We all have trouble sometimes. I want your best, Carmi. I want the best ones. Okay, so you want a horror story. Once upon a time, there's a company called Marshall Fields, which I know you know well. Oh, dear to my heart, yes. <laughs> and we were we had a container of uh, really, really neat uh, filigree silver angels and wire angels that we had created for them. And the shipment was late. It was really late. And Thanksgiving was coming up. We sold to, uh, and still do, to big box, but mostly specialty stores. And we had... 5,000 accounts at at one point. Anyway, the container comes in late and we pop open the back of the container and there's not one single ornament in the back of the container, but there's probably 15 foot Christmas trees that kind of look like cousin it from uh, the Adams family. (laughs) Oh my God. So what happened? They switched up the order? 
Yeah, well, they sent our container to Rotterdam. Oh, no. And we got the uh, German company's uh, Christmas trees, and we had to scramble. And trying to convince a Filipino factory to air freight a 20-foot container to Los Angeles was quite a challenge. <laughs> and, of course, we would have been charged back, and we you know, stuck with all these goods, and it was all pre-packed, and Marshall's Field's name was all over it. So we were desperate, and we actually got it there. We got charged back a ton. But I think part of the challenge wasn't just getting the product there and staying calm about it, but how to resolve our relationship with the factory after the fact who we had a pretty good relationship for many years. And, and we actually went to Manila, sat in the Westin Hotel, had a big mediation, you know, who's going to pay for what. To this day, I look back at it and I laugh. To this day, I'm still working with that same factory, which is almost 30 years. And I'm kind of old school in the sense that I really like relationships. Once I find a good factory to work with, it's much more than business to me. It's really friendship and trying to find like minds where we can sit down and create so we all win and make a profit out of the venture. Even though clearly it was, it sounds like, 100% their fault, you wanted to make sure that however you're going to resolve it, each of you stayed whole so that you could continue with the relationship, right? It was a very big challenge because, it, I mean, we were really talking about a lot of money. I'm sure. So, yeah, and to this day, I still would deal with that same factory in my latest project. And actually, this week, we got a shipment that was damaged. <laughs> oh, wouldn't you know? <laughs> and, and we went through the similar conversation last night. It's a challenge, but, you know, we're a little more experienced. So any advice for someone else encountering the same type of thing? Maybe even on a smaller level, but where you end up having an issue with a vendor, whether it's someone who's manufacturing a part for you, manufacturing the whole piece, any words of wisdom here? Yeah, I think there's a lot of curveballs all the time being thrown at you. One of the worst ones, and I know that there's a big paranoia around this issue, is, is being knocked off or copied. You know, how to deal with those issues is very difficult because as a creative, we all take this very, very personally. It is still business, but, you know, my advice when somebody copies your product, unless it's really some technology product or something that's very unique that you clearly you should get some kind of patent or trademark on the product if that's the case. But I tend to kind of pass over and move on as much as it hurts, even to this date. So I think... Putting things in perspective and looking at the bigger view is really important sometimes. Not easy, particularly when it's affecting your pocketbook. But we all take a lot of twists and turns in research, development, and production, and bad production, and prototyping. I think as you grow with this business, or the creative side of it and the design side, we learn to put it in perspective a little more. Mm -hmm. I would agree with you. I have to share with you that when I was at a trade show, and I'm going to be very general here because I don't know what kind of trouble I could get into, but I ran into somebody who was intentionally walking the show to find interesting products that they could then turn around and make in China. Their turnaround time was seriously less than a week. They could switch up and get things out on shelves in the U.S., almost in a week. Now, having said that, so I think your point is, you know, at some point, there are some battles I guess you just can't fight. What I would say, though, for gift biz listeners who are smaller businesses where you're the jewelry maker and your love and your hands and everything goes into the designs of your jewelry, this is where, as Carmi was talking about earlier, stories are so important because people cannot duplicate you, the stories you provide, the personality that you bring to your product, how you present yourself and your business if you're online. So these are ways that you can somewhat shelter yourself from competitors because, yes, they could probably make the exact same product, cheaper material, but they can't be you. So something to think about as you move on and don't let this fear that you're going to get knocked off stop you from doing what you're doing. Definitely. You know, I think moving it forward, and you almost have to confide and trust in people across the board. Like a lot of people, I don't like dealing with lawyers. And so I think depending on what you're doing, uh, the circumstances and the product, you have to put everything into perspective again on how much investment of time you're going to take into protecting your product, which is very costly. I think that, you know, I've been knocked off so many times and copied in my merchandise and my products. And to this day, it's still going on. But <laughs> I try to keep it pretty low keyed as far as dealing with the whole legal side of things. 
Yeah, because and you're also then sitting in a place of really bad energy, you know, when you're having to do things like that. 100%. All right. Well, I know we could sit here and talk about all of this for a really long time, but I want to get into your newest product because now you're doing something fresh and new. And for people who are just thinking about starting to create something for themselves, I think this will be really interesting. So to refresh everyone's memory, Carmi is turning motherboards into decor and art sculptures, and he's calling them computer bugs to love. So let's talk about how this started. I shut down my prosperity tree company about nine years ago so I could have a life and ended up designing for a bigger gift company some of my designs and got into the world of licensing. And I love the idea of upcycling, which upcycling is a term that really didn't exist a few years ago. It's really taking recycled items and turning them into something that is really a treasured product. I love the concept of upcycling myself and we've actually been doing upcycling for years years and years a lot of packaging in particular you know we would take particularly working in the philippines cardboard boxes that we would get from the local texas instrument factory and recycle those into our packaging mostly because it was affordable now there's a big problem going on with computer motherboards which is the inside circuitry of computers where it's really becoming landfill And as everybody knows, the amount of PCs and desktops and all the electronics is just overwhelming how much they're producing. And so there's clearly a problem what to do with this products. We're doing something in a very small way. So thinking out of the box, as I usually do in product design, this concept of taking a motherboard, you know, the term, it's really a computer circuit board. And we say, by the way, hug your motherboard. (laughs) We're cutting them up and we are turning them into bugs. And then we're putting them on a poster, hanging them on a wall so they sit on the desk and they're art sculptures. But going back to the story, I can't seem to create products without putting a storyline with them. In this case, we're calling each individual bug, which kind of looks like a real bug, but not really. Uh, It's really bugs of our own creations. We're calling them kilobyte, gigabyte, spam a lot, iris virus, terabyte. Love it. And we tell the story of what we're really doing with these motherboards. And in this case, we took it a little bit further and romanced the story and said that these computer bugs, if you place them near your computer, will act as a antivirus type of product, which will hopefully keep the spam and keep your computer as healthy as can be. But the main focus that we've got here is green on recycling but the bugs are really cool looking yeah they are they don't do anything they sit there and they're sculptural although we've talked about maybe in the future having them do something it's quite a challenge i have to tell you in many many years of doing production this is one of the more difficult things we've worked on just because one sourcing the right type of computer board making sure there's no lead in it cutting it up putting it all together with the you know the metal acetate wings and the beads and the legs it's a very involved project and uh, we're really just starting to grow the product and scale it a little bit. And, you know, we're in a bunch of catalogs and hundreds of stores and really hit a focus because there's a real awareness right now in the whole green eco category, which we love being in. That being said, my design eye is really on a whole bunch of other things going on that is really focused more around trying to make some products in the USA. Got it. Okay. Question that comes to mind for me here. Are you worried or is there any concern about suggesting a promise that someone might not think is just a story? You know, like how you're saying the bug is going to help you not have viruses or, you know, that kind of thing. I just want to be careful because we're talking a lot about stories here that we don't have anybody get into a problem that they make a claim that their product can do something that it can't. We frame it in such a way where it's kind of like legend says or this can be a gift of we really try to romance a little more like a storyline than something that's factual i mean it's pretty obvious in this case that that can't happen i was just wondering that the idea was coming up as you were talking about it yeah that's a valid point i don't generally speaking most people don't bring it up i think where these products land in galleries and we're selling a lot of museum gift stores i think people when they come into those type of gift environments, they see a lot of that type of storyline going on. So yeah, but valid point. 
Okay, so can you give some advice? Because you created so many products. If someone has an idea, but they have no clue how to get started, what are the first steps, maybe three to five steps of what someone should do? They've never done this before to bring a concept that they have into reality as a real life tangible product. It's a tough one, but I think the first thing, clearly we all have these notions in our heads on how do we get those onto paper and get some prototyping and get pricing and manufacturers. First and foremost, putting it on paper. The second thing I try to do is to any which way I can prototype it. Sometimes, depending on what the medium is, whether it's metal, ceramic, if it's technology product, it's clearly going to be much more involved. But Lately, I haven't been like this all the time. Lately, I like to prototype in the U.S. if I can. But there's a lot. It becomes so much easier as far as trying to source new ideas overseas. I love the vehicle of Alibaba. You know, it's a Chinese manufacturing site, which the thousands and thousands of manufacturers are available where you can really communicate very quickly with manufacturers. Of course, then there's that element that everybody's worried about them stealing your idea. So the thing I don't like about Alibaba, because I'm a little old school, is I like relationships. I really like creating relationships with my manufacturers who I can trust. That doesn't mean you can trust every one of your manufacturers. So do you need to get some legal protection first before you would share that piece of paper or napkin or whatever it is? You know, it's funny. I met with a toy manufacturer from China recently. I flew to Las Vegas to a toy fair and showed him some prototypes I had. And I just brought them with because I figured to have somebody sign a non-disclosure, it's very difficult to enforce it. Do you think it's more of, though, a kind of a psychological barrier, at least? Yes, certainly. I think it's in a very, very good thing to consider. However, what I find is that most people are not as passionate about your product as you are. Also, I find that most people will not really try to copy a product until they see there's some kind of success surrounding it. So I think that's where the scalability and being prepared to scale it is important. But I think initially, unless they've really got a keen eye, I don't think most people are going to deal with your ideas. Again, it depends on the medium, what it is, where your market is. But I think Alibaba is a good starting point or AliExpress for the China side of things. Lately, I've been working and uh, designing some toy products and playhouses out of wood. It's kind of interesting. Last October, I started by contacting somebody who I met on Alibaba. Initially, had them do prototypes, which I didn't like. Took those prototypes to Milwaukee, had a laser cutting factory make me some prototypes. Didn't like their version or prices. And I ended up in the south of Chicago, where today I just got a quote, which looks pretty healthy to me, and we'll take it to the next step. It's kind of been a, a little bit of a journey. We're into it for about six or seven months right now, just a prototype and pricing. My latest obsession, again, is trying to make something in the USA, which is certainly a challenge when you're used to pricing that you get overseas. Okay. So first you have your concept on paper, then you get a prototype done either where you live, because since we have international (laughs) listeners, it could be wherever you live, locally if you can, you actually have your product and you buy in some type of bulk, whatever the agreement is with that manufacturer, then what do you do? Well, again, usually the prototyping costs money also. Most people don't prototype you for free, so you have to have a little bit of budget there. And there's a lot of back and forth around that. One of the things I would highly recommend, which is kind of an interesting insight when you're prototyping, particularly if you're doing it overseas versus here, you can get some of these folks in the factories in China to do some of your design work for you. It takes a little bit of talking to work together, but it's a collaborative process, which is pretty neat, and it can help save you some time to use them as an art source, really, for drawing out items. So uh, what do you do then? Our world right now, as far as bringing product to market, is pretty focused on the online world. You know, my roots really were brick and mortar and wholesaling to the brick and mortar world. Not really involved with retail until recently. So I tend to encourage a lot of people who I mentor in the maker community here in Chicago to really take a hard look at some more traditional venues like trade shows, advertising, 
Certainly door-to-door sales. I mean, I can't tell you, this is the oddest story, you know, Thanksgiving, I was in San Francisco walking through the airport and came across a beautiful gallery, walked in, grabbed a business card, and anyway, long story, I ended up in five different airport stores just from grabbing one business card and contacting them later on. Similar story happened to me in the airport in Chicago. So I think Cold calling is a tough way to go, but I think it's a good way to go. I think that the email communication is really, really good too. As far as online sales direct to the consumer, big challenges, big costs there. Those are strategic decisions you have to make based on your product. Retail versus wholesale, another big decision. I think that these days, from my perspective, staying focused on one or the other rather than both at the same time is much to my advantage. I tend to focus a little more on the wholesale for myself, but I'm not ignoring the retail. Okay, but especially if you're starting out and if you're smaller, don't have a lot of resources, you're just getting going, focus on one versus both at the same time. I think one of the very important key points which I missed, when you first get your ideas and you're going forward and you're just not sure, talk it up with people you know, show it to as many people as you can. I am constantly, constantly doing that, whether it's with my daughter or my wife or my relatives or my friends, you know, and they a lot of times shoot down my glorious ideas, (laughs) which never feels good, but it's just a huge amount of help because all my experience after all these years, I still don't quite, particularly when you're coming up with a brand new concept like a computer bug, who knows whether something like that's going to sell. And you don't really know. I didn't have proof of concept really until I went to a uh, local trade show and walked away with a bunch of orders. You were talking it up right as the idea was being conceptualized, if you will, and then probably also when you had the prototype. Correct. So all the way along the way. You don't want to figure this out after you've spent all that money. At least you want as much of the advantage on your side as possible by people saying, yes, they think it's a good idea. And not people who are just going to make you feel good and say yes. People who will really challenge you. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I had a bad habit of doing early in my career, and I've fallen back into it, is, you know, sometimes we create products and we bring them to market and we don't back it up with inventory and just to see if people will bite on it. It's less risky, but, you know, there's a little bit of peace of mind where you haven't invested all this inventory or time into a project that you don't think is going to fly. I think it's a judgment call, though, too, because part of it is how long is the production cycle, right? Right. But you've got that certain point there that we were just talking about that right when something comes onto market, if it's a big hit, that's when you can get knocked off. So it's probably very dependent on what the product is how long the cycle is to determine, you know, how much should you make at first to see if it's going to work. And if it does really work and your production cycle isn't too long, then you could reorder right away just because you want to try and not have somebody knock you off. Right. But one of the things what happens as you grow, I think that is different when you're small, is that once you get your channels of distribution set, you can be guaranteed almost that your existing customer base is always going to buy X percent so that it's, there's much less risk. In the old days when we were bringing container after container and we weren't able to sell this particular pattern or this particular style, we had access to sell off to liquidators or a TJ Maxx or something like that. So we had a cycle created that would allow us to constantly turn the merchandise and continue to bring out newer and newer, which I don't know if that's still the case with some products. It's a little stressful, frankly, going that route. So it's challenging. A lot of it is based on, again, as you said, is production time, sales time. This project I'm working on right now with the computer bugs, huge amount of time to make them, huge amount of time to receive the goods. So I guess in summary, what I think you would agree with, you correct me if I'm wrong, Carmi, is that once you're in production, then get your plan together. Know what you're doing with these and get working on it. Don't wait until the product gets there. Right. So part is the idea, then you've got the production, then you've got the marketing and sales. Right. And two other major points, taking the risk. At some point, you have to take the risk. And it never feels right, (laughs) particularly with new products. But the other big, big risk that nobody, and I find particularly people I mentor, is they don't really want to invest money in marketing or traditional ways of going to trade shows unless they can really 
help it. And I agree with that 100%, but I don't agree with it at all. I think that it really takes some capital investment to move forward. And when I say move forward, move forward more than a snail's pace, because some of these projects, you know, people sit on projects and ideas for years. And how do you move things forward? A lot of times you move things forward with money. Very good point. And a great place for us to close this up because we're going to have to carry on a little bit. I want to move into our reflection section. And Carmi, we're going to do this really kind of quick because I wanted you to keep talking about your story because you're just a wealth of experience and learning for us. But I want to talk through just a little bit about you and what you found to help you succeed along the way. Is there a natural trait that you have that you feel like you've been calling upon this whole time in the gift industry that's helped you to take those risks and to build all these products and be successful? One thing that I cherish is my relationships with uh, customers and manufacturers. I think really creating that relationship is really an important feature for me moving forward. I love collaboration, whether it's with my manufacturer or with my customers. For example, I have a customer in uh, Kansas City recently who was looking at one of our computer angels. <laughs> They're angels that are created out of the motherboards. And he really came up with this concept. Oh, well, this is great. Not only is it an ornament, but you know, maybe this is an even better idea for the idea of some kind of protection type of or guardian angel concept, you know, surrounding the computer. His idea... You know, we collaborated really quickly, and next thing I knew, I was bringing the product to market when he was buying it. So it's a kind of an interesting scenario of customers working with us to work together so that we're kind of a team, although we're really on separate sides. I like the give back side of things, too. I really think that assigning some kind of giving back to charity or fair trade, one of the two, where you're really helping others with the sale of the product or with the creation of the product. And I'll just give you a very, very quick example. Uh, my mom suffered with breast cancer for many years, and I always wanted to give something back to some breast cancer organization or research organization. And we came up with a product line called Woman of Valor, which is based on a biblical psalm, which talked about women and, you know, and their role and all the positive attributes of being a woman. And we put that in our hang tag again, and we created a really cool, beautiful design and we gave a certain percentage of the sale to National Breast Cancer Research and National Breast Cancer Foundation. And I, without thinking about the marketing side of things, because we really were talking about mostly about the give back, all of a sudden we just hit a big home run with people buying the product just because of the association from the woman theme to the breast cancer giving side of things. I think there's something very, very wonderful about that give back side of creation and sales and helping people that really makes doing what I do even more gratifying. Beautiful. Yeah, totally agree with you there. Okay, so Carmi, what tool do you use regularly that helps you stay productive or to create some balance between all of these products that you're doing and a personal life? <laughs> If there is such a thing, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, having a computer and my phone at, at my access all the time is really just a disaster. First of all, when you're dealing with China or Philippines or Europe or wherever you're dealing with, the time zone's always a difference. So you're always, you know, three o'clock in the morning is prime time to talk to people. So trying to wean yourself off of the clock and the devices is certainly a big challenge. Just by nature of your business, you have no choice almost. I mean, you have your phone and your computer going. Yeah, and I think, you know, being an entrepreneur, I never stop. You know, I'm always talking it up. I'm always exploring. I'm always coming up with ideas in the most bizarre places. And I think it's part of who you are. And I've kind of embraced it. And keeping it away from the family is a little bit of a challenge. But I think it kind of goes the other way around. They stay away from me. <laughs> <laughs> So would you say when your time with your family, you really have it focused on time with your family, though? I mean, you find the little bites of time that can just be personal time with family? I think the one thing I've learned over the years, the quality of life is an important side of your work, and it can take over your life, and it does at times. But how to engage it back is, is certainly a challenge. Right. Well, and, you know, you have to be able to do some type of balance, or you couldn't be in it for the long haul like you're doing. Carmi, is there a book that you've read lately that you think our listeners could find some value in? 
You know, I, I've been reading Siddhartha, you know, which is a Herman Hess book about Buddha in the world of meditation. I don't really meditate, but I find that it, it gives me a little bit better perspective on life as I get older to calm things down a little bit. I think that, again, taking a step back about not just treating business as business is an important feature to how I work these days. I really like to have a win-win type of environment, and I love, love working with people who I really like. And so, which is not always the case, you know, sometimes we have to work with people and, you know, work through these difficult relationships and, you know, it's all life, but it certainly happens a lot with manufacturing and sales and customer service and customer service is certainly an ongoing challenge for everybody. <laughs> well, and sometimes you do need to meditate and just calm yourself down. And, you know, meditation, I think in the whole, entre- you know, everyone talks about entrepreneurship these days, meditation meditation is, you know, and being grateful and all of that are big topics these days. And Gift Biz listeners, just as you're listening to this podcast today, you can also listen to audiobooks with ease. Possibly also Herman Hesse's book is on audio. I don't know. I've teamed up with Audible for you to be able to get an audiobook like this for free on me. All you need to do is go to giftbizbook.com and make a selection. That is giftbizbook.com. Okay, Carmi, with your creative mind, I am really interested to see what happens when I invite you to Dare to Dream. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. So this is your dream or your goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside your box? I'm going to speak for the moment. My obsession as of late is to work with artists and work with factories in the U.S., which is a very big challenge, but a really wonderful experience for me. So I think that domestic and USA-based manufacturing and design, to me, uh, just a magical moment to see happen, particularly after a career where I'm really dealing with mostly international uh, manufacturing. On the other hand, the idea that I can help people in a fair trade environment overseas, which has really been the case mostly in the Philippines rather than China. We're really working with people who are super creative, don't have the ways and means, and really helping them move forward to not only just create products, but really create some kind of community and life around some kind of manufacturing environment. So combination of fair trade, concepts that's really been going on for a long time, and also domestic manufacturing so that in both cases helping people move forward in a creative spirit i have to just say that i don't know if i have another word in here but i love this podcast oh you're so sweet (laughs) take as much time as you want carmy (laughs) i love this podcast i love the idea of just talking to the people who are out there about the different experiences that i've been listening on this podcast i think it's a huge service to help entrepreneur the makers the um, creators the developers the factories I think it's definitely addressing some of the harder issues on what's going on. Everybody has some very interesting journeys, and listening to this podcast is just very, very, very wonderful. Oh, thank you, Carmi. I so appreciate that. And Gift Biz listeners, I will have the show notes page, as I do with each episode, and if you want to connect up with Carmi, you want to see the bugs, because they are absolutely so super cute, and everything else he has going on, then you'll just go over to his show notes page on giftbizunwrapped.com. Carmi, relationships, oh my gosh, you talk about it throughout the whole talk here, and honestly, in the end, whether it's relationships with your customers, your manufacturers, now we've created a relationship with everybody who's listening today, right? So it's all about people helping people. Thank you so much for all your comments about the show. I really do appreciate that. And I love your future vision in terms of fair trade and then also getting some production back here in the U.S., which would absolutely be fabulous. And I know that's going to happen. I wish you much success. And since you're right around in my area, I know I'll be seeing you. So I'll be able to get updated on a regular basis, I'm sure. But we all wish you the very, very best. And may your candle always burn bright. Thank you, Sue. It's been wonderful. Appreciate it. Today's show is sponsored by The Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? Customization is more popular now than ever. 
brand your products of your logo, or print a Happy Birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. Do you know that you should be out networking, but you just can't get yourself to do it because it's scary? Are you afraid that you might walk into the room and not know anybody? Or that you're going to freeze when you get up to do that infamous elevator speech where you talk about yourself and your business? Well, I'm here to tell you that it doesn't need to be scary if you know what to do. To help you with this, I would like to offer you a coffee chat. For the price of buying me a cup of coffee, we can sit down through an online video and I'll tell you everything that I know about networking and how I have personally built two multi-six-figure businesses primarily through networking. You'll walk away with a solid understanding about how networking can truly grow your business. And you're going to have newfound confidence because I'm going to give you 10 fill-in-the-blank templates that you can use for your introduction message. To learn more about this opportunity, just go over to bit.ly forward slash network ninja. That's bit.ly forward slash network ninja.